experience with that. So should we be talking about population pie mass extra variables? Okay, so this topic area has a technical problem, but so I was asked to talk about populations of high mass X-ray binaries. So that's a very wide field, and um, I could have gone in various different directions. So the direction I chose is the direction that I thought has a lot of potential for the, the Scrobex mission. And as I dug into it, I really saw a lot of the amazing things that uh, this mission is going to be able to do. So when I think of populations of extra high mass X-ray binaries, I think about a population of high mass X-ray binaries in some external galaxy, where we can do whole galaxy studies of those X-ray binaries. This is an animation of IC10. And then if we see sources turning on, turning off, changing in brightness, some of these are uh, eclipsing systems, the IC10 X1, the bright source in the middle, the eclipsing black hole and that's X-ray binary. And some of the other sources in the field are potentially HMXPs, and then there are other sources in there that are nothing to do with HMXPs, and are just intervening uh, flare stars in the foreground. So of course, with strobes, we don't have imaging, we only have the one pixel. So certain types of sources, class of objects, are going to be very well observed by strobex. Certain other classes are going to be difficult. So one of the classes, of course, that's going to be very well observed is pulsating sources. If they exist in external galaxies, but as we just heard from Matt, they evidently do. So strobex and high mass X-ray binaries. So I didn't look at this as an end of the photon starvation kind of bottleneck that we've reached. Um, Hundred X and Adam to revolutionize the study of populations by isolating individual sources in hundreds now of uh, external galaxies. But we, in many cases, don't know very much about the individual nature of those sources. Most of what we know comes from things like hardness ratios, quantile diagrams, and looking for optical counterparts, which is almost impossible once you get beyond uh, machinatic types because there just become so many potential optical counterparts. And that situation isn't likely to improve with better telescopes because there'll be even more potential optical so, using these populations as new laboratories requires at least an order of magnitude gain in signals of noise so that we can learn everything that we need to know from x-rays and not rely on having to crack down the optical counterparts, even if we are someday able to do so. So, the large area detector and the SXRC both have their great capabilities in this area and they're, they're very complementary because they're wide spectrum coverage. The, uh, the LED is a very similar uh, um, collimator response, I don't know in detail this collimator response, it's similar to RXD, DCA, but the full width half max is about the same, about one degree full width half max, which means that many of these um, local group galaxies will fit completely within one collimator response, and so pulsating sources will be able to be disentangled from one another by the same kind of techniques that we use with PCA for the SMC, where it's possible to disentangle multiple pulsars all simultaneously in the, in the field due to various different 3 d composition methods. The uh, SXRC, with its uh, much higher signal noise due to its uh, tighter collimator response, will be able to um, look for pulsations in all of the, the galactic transients and also in luminous extragalactic sources, uh, HMXBs and the OLXs. Um, the idea of uh, looking at X-ray populations, so I feel that they offer a chance to perform controlled experiments that uh, can only really be used that will leverage the statistical samples of objects that we can put together. So the greater um, those large samples that we can put together in different environments, different metallicity environments, different age environments, different places uh, along those lines, we can start putting together statistical samples to test various um, long-standing questions in uh, fundamental physics and also in the uh, phenomenology of uh, X-ray binary. So other phenomenology that can, and uh, actual fundamental parameters that can be indirectly inferred, such as the rotational inertia of neutron stars and the fields of neutron stars that as we've heard in various talks of mass and radius. So uh, cyclotron lines and other features have been observed in many galactic sources, but so far they've been very difficult to observe in extra galactic sources. We haven't had any instrument with enough effective area above uh, maybe 20 keV, so that will change with, uh, with this mission with the large area detectors. And uh, something that is incredible that um, Strobex will do is it will be able to observe single individual pulsations in a large number of all of the galactic high mass X-ray binaries. So we keep reading this word about Rosetta Stones and all the rest of it, and Holy Grail, I don't know which one that is. Okay. So there's a really good um, reason to suppose that there's variation from one pulsation to the next in many of these systems. There are transient phenomena that occur in all types of pulsars, and um, we're ne we'll never be able to see those until we can examine individual pulsations. So as in so many other areas that we've heard about this, uh, this two days, 
um, Strobex is an incredible mission because it alone targets the actual time scale of which fundamental processes are occurring in a large number of the types of systems we're interested in. Okay, so some things I'm not going to explain, go into very much in the talk, there are dips and eclipses that are seen in the disks of many high mass X-ray binaries. And um, they, those are still quite mysterious in their nature, and they can give a lot of importance to the disk precession and uh, circumstellar disk to maintain HMAs, please. So we're going to look at a few other things. So let's move on to the next slide. So these are the, um, this is the famous luminosity function of uh, Green, Bill, and Samaya, and various versions of this have been created since uh, this figure was, was played. And it's very interesting, of course, because it shows that the luminosity function of uh, star forming galaxies is a uniform, a universal power law. And its normalization appears to be controlled by the star formation rate. However, when we look at galaxies with different metallicity and various other environmental factors, we might expect that the scaling relation might be different. So uh, the large numbers of the 10 possible HMXBs seen in uh, compact blue galaxies by uh, Broby and Prestwich have, uh, have shown some evidence that this uh, universal law has differences in slope and normalization in different environments. So there's another interesting fact to this, which is that HMXBs by their nature are highly variable for many of them transients. So how can it be that we have a universal scale in noise that is populated largely by variable sources? So um, some wonderful work being done recently by uh, Brianna Binder and collaborators looking at how the extra luminosity functions of the variable sources in various galaxies. So this is NGC 300, is an uh, obstacle in showing these 25 radius, which more or less fits inside the ACI field of view. So if you kind of project the um, strobe X field of view onto this, the whole galaxy would fit inside the, um, the lab, but the um, HS, the, um, the concentrator, would be much smaller if it was four degrees, uh, four up minutes rather, it would be one of these CCDs. So in these top plots, we see the uh, luminosity function made from the persistent sources, and in the lower plots, we see the, uh, the luminosity function composed from the variable and transient sources. And in the paper, they go on to demonstrate that these uh, log n log s distributions are extremely <coughs> similar to one another. And then they go into a uh, Monte Carlo type uh, simulation exercise to determine what kind of duty cycles, luminosity, distributions, and so forth, you can put together to recreate um, luminosity functions that are consistent with the observed luminosity functions. And in that way, you can pick up some idea of what are the duty cycles and luminosities of the transient and variable sources, and therefore what might they be. So, get binder it, I'll find that uh, HMXB that we're going to interact with us will dominate the transients of these systems. So those systems, of course, in our galaxy, in the measure and claims, are uh, all pulsar systems. So there's potentially a huge number of these systems that we can go off and get with, um, with strobe X. So other population distributions that can be applied, I'm going to go through a few of the different population distributions for HMXD that people are studying. So this is the population distribution of the age of the progenitor populations, as uh, first uh, discovered here by Antonio and Zizas and collaborators using the data from the SMC and the LMC and other groups have recently done this same technique in other local group galaxies and found very interesting <coughs> results. So the technique uses uh, very high resolution Chandra images like these of uh, fields in uh, star forming galaxies, find all the HMXBs and then go and find the stars in small circles around them and plot their color magnitude diagrams and then do a crude form of um, isophotal, uh, isophotal, what's the word? Uh, my, my brain is locked off by optical astronomy for a moment because we've been studying it. Isochronal. Isochronal thing, right, thank you. To uh, determine the age of the stellar population in the immediate vicinity of the individual X ray sources and then accumulate that over the whole population of the galaxy. And then that is plotted in this log space binning here of the age of the underlying population. And so we found that in the SMC, for example, that the HMX speed is strongly concentrated in a peak somewhere between 40 and 70, 40 and 70 million years. In the LMC, there's a peak that goes at slightly younger ages. So if we go and look at other star-forming galaxies, the same thing can be tried. So IC10, for example, is one of the youngest star-forming galaxies in the local universe, which has a uh, starburst age of less than 10 million years. We could ask, you know, what will we see if we go there? Will we see the same types of HMX speeds? And of course, the reason to go and do this is that the driving factors into going stellar evolution 
and also the evolution of the competing binaries over time, are things like stellar rotation, which is in turn governed perhaps by mass loss rates and, and metallicity. So there's good reason to want to go and collect large samples of, of, uh, of systems in, in other galaxies. So we're not going to get this kind of data with, um, with strobe X, obviously. And in fact, we don't need to, because Trunk and XMO have already done a wonderful job of pinning down the localization of many, many, many of these systems. And now what remains to be done is to go after them with a very, very, very large light bucket and collect enough photons to see if we can find the pulsations. And it won't matter that we can't resolve the individual sources, because if we expect them to have unique pulse periods, and even if they're not that unique, you would, you would be able to plot their period derivatives and so forth and to discover which sources we're looking at. So this is a, a slide from a, a, a not yet published paper of Andrea Cesar's and Diana, uh, which um, is looking at the uh, X-ray visionary project, which has used uh, Chandra's and that, a whole large number of fields, 11 fields in the SMC for 100 kiloseconds each, which would push and limit what, uh, what Chandra, come to Chandra observing time you can get on these objects. So the SMC is several degrees across, but you'll see that we didn't try to observe the whole galaxy. We observed certain regions that are known to have very young stellar populations and contrasting ages and large, large um, concentrations of supernova remnants, things like that. So the fact that Strobe X doesn't see the whole galaxy is not a problem. There are no regions that we'd like to look at and uh, stare at, potentially, to, uh, to track down the nature of all the pulsars that are presumably hiding in there. So, Here's an example of another galaxy where we can do uh, the same kind of uh, thing, although we're not quite at that stage yet. It's an IC10, a local group dwarf galaxy, has a much higher star formation rate per unit mass than any other local group galaxy. And uh, taking the Chandra um, point source um, catalog for this field and matching it against the optical catalog of uh, Massey et al., we find that there's a lot of optical counterparts. And we can ask them, which are, are these H HMXBs? Because at this distance, the only stars that should show up in the color magnitude diagram would be the blue supergiant branch of the uh, HR diagram. So that's these stars here that are circled. And all these stars over here, which are kind of parts, are also they're probably part of the, the foreground field. So we're still left with the question, are these things coincidental alignments, or are they really potentially real HMXBs in that galaxy? So we did a um, peak up test where we uh, realigned the two catalogs and a grid of offset for each one, accumulate the number of uh, counterparts and see a significant peak, and we can do the statistics for that peak, and that's what's in the, the right-hand panel. And then we can furthermore kind of track this thing down on uh, other observable properties of the objects. So the two cuts that are being made here, the black curve is a radial projection centered on that white line in the distribution, just of all optical counterparts, and the blue line is only selecting in the blue supergiant sequence of IC10. So we see that there is a significant peak, which shows us that many of those X-ray point sources in IC10 are indeed high mass X-ray binaries, and so we might expect them to be pulsars. But we don't, at the moment, have any instrument that can go and see if they are or not. So my grad student, uh, Jun Yang, recently took a 130 kilosecond XMM observation that includes IC10 and crunched through all the, the data in there and didn't find any pulsars, which uh, it was a little disappointing, but if you consider that the, uh, the sensitivity is it's not very good when you have XMM's background, and you maybe only have 100 counts for one source, and the total number of background counts is maybe 100 counts, and your 100 real counts is spread out over the entirety of 130 kiloseconds of data gaps and so forth. It's really very difficult, and you don't get the kind of scaling in long observations that you would get um, in a more ideal case for low background. So, this next slide is the kind of data that we would like to have all the time for every X-ray binary that we've ever looked at. So this is coming from the XVP data. This is a plot from Hong et al. Uh, 2016. And it is a um, pulse phase photon energy intensity diagram. So the x-axis is pulse phase. It's an event file to be folded. So this shows that what we really want from strobe X is a time tag event data, if we can have it at the kind of event rates that we're going to get. And um, we can see that the pulse profile is strong, it's a strong function of energy and uh, furthermore, that you know, we can extract pulse profiles at various different energy bands, but these only tell a tiny fraction of the true story. And if we look at many, many of these, we'll, we, we, you would rapidly discern that the energy bands that you pick very, very strongly constrain what kind of pulse profiles you see. So it's not like it's a legitimate thing to do, I think, to say we're going to take energy bands that are pre-described for all pulsars and study. We really have to do something much more sophisticated, which requires many more counts. 
So this is a 100 kilosecond counter exposure with thousands of counts in it. And during this observation, you can't see it in the way this data is plotted, the, the, the map changed dramatically. And so we needed 100 kiloseconds stacked up to get this picture of the energy dependent um, cosmic morphology. But it's not real because it's something that's changing all the time during the observation. So we would like to get this on the time scale shorter than the time scale with the pulse and morphology, the magnetosphere's configuration is actually changing. And that time scale could be as short as one pulse period. That's the shortest that it could be. And of course, the longest may be, if we're lucky, it may be some tens of pulse periods. OK, this is just to demonstrate the fact that every pulse profile you've probably ever seen was the average of tens of thousands, potentially, of individual cycles. And it's very interesting question that uh, discussing the Kretschmer recently that when you look at the envelope of a um, kind of density or any other uh, representation of these very, very large average stacks of pulse profiles, you never really know if the apparent error bar is because the pulse profile is changing during the observation or if it's just statistical noise. You know, there are timing noises that is likely to be a thing and it's likely to be interesting. Maybe in certain accretion states the pulse profiles are intrinsically smooth and uh, rec rec what's the word, um, well repeated from one to another. In other states, they may un undergo some kind of chaotic stochastic variability on top of the, the um, periodic component, which at the moment we're completely blind to. Okay, so another distribution type that can be plotted is the um, distribution of spin periods. This isn't the most up-to-date distribution of spin periods, but it's just here to show you that X-ray pulsars have periods down maybe around 0.1 seconds at their shortest, and they're known up to many thousands of seconds, which is an open question as to how they got there. And the average is perhaps somewhere in the tens to hundreds of seconds. We don't really know why this is. What is it that drives the pulse periods to, to where they are? There are all kinds of important clues from things like the Corbett diagram. And um, people have tried to you get a more sophisticated by trying to get more and more objects to populate the pulse period distribution. So, Kennedy et al. in uh, 2011 put together the pulse period distribution to the uh, SMC, the LMC, and the Milky Way and demonstrated that it appears to be bimodal and they heralded this as evidence that there are different types of neutron stars and maybe therefore there are different channels for the formation of neutron stars. But there is no theory as of now that predicts why the distribution is what it is. So, we would like to fill it in. This plot shows, for the SMC at least, a population of um, all of the period, all of the systems with known pulse periods and known orbital periods. And this is the COVID diagram just plotted for the SMC. And some of these sources we've been looking at them long enough to know that they have very, very slow long term average period derivative on top of the accretion torques that we see from one observation to the next. And it turns out that about a third of these, as was shown by Yang et al. 2017, have a long-term spin up, about a third of a long-term spin down, and about a third are consistent within the errors, which suggests that these systems are near spin equilibrium, which uh, Ho and Kluse say is an important factor if you want to use the um, accretion, balance, accretion torque balance method to calculate their, their magnetic field strengths. <coughs> okay, this next part is the Corbett diagram for more sources. I'm not going to talk about it a lot, probably have probably seen it before, but the idea that you know, the specific angular momentum transfer um, means that pulsars basically switch on and stay in spin equilibrium at a period that's governed by the type of companion, the type of angular momentum transfer that occurs, and also uh, in some way by the, the, the orbital period. Now, this has always bothered me because I never understood why the orbital period should be what it is and why the spin period should be what it is, and therefore why do those particular pulsars turn on in spin equilibrium and not others, other pulsars? So, this is an effort at trying to look at how the two distributions are coupled. It's a very simplistic simple minded effort, a Monte Carlo simulation, putting in various different spin period distributions. So this one here is a right-handed side of a Gaussian, and then propagating it through the Corbett diagram, or some relation uh, fits the Corbett diagram, to see what kind of orbital period distribution we get out of it. We could play the game in reverse, so that we could say, are we actually seeing a complete sampling of the underlying spin period distribution of pulsars, or are we seeing the evidence of some kind of uh, other physics that's causing the pulsars to be um, in inhibited at same under certain conditions. So we all know that there's a really good reason to suppose that the short period also, fast spinning one, these guys that could be here, are inhibited at uh, short spin periods because they could be under the uh, propeller effect. So, Dimitris um, Christodoulou um, took all of the extent detections and non-detections, every pulsar that we could find in the entire literature, 
and uh, plotted this graph which shows the range in luminosity all scaled to a common standard against pulse period. And the dotted line is a, uh, a sort of empirical uh, scaled version of this uh, relationship derived from the Gaussian man uh, formalism for the propeller line that he spins at the minus 7 thirds power. And we, if we could track all the pulsars down to the point where they stop pulsing, where they cross the propeller line, be able to measure the magnetic field in principle for every one of these pulsars individually. And the trouble is, our existing data um, runs out of signals and noise, it runs out of the ability to detect the pulsations before it gets to the propeller line for any pulsar that has a period longer than about a couple of seconds. And we like to be optimistic and say it's about 10 seconds, but really perhaps a little bit too optimistic. So all the points in, in yellow are not pulse detections, they're unpulse detections. And this is the AF538 over here, which is the I guess the longest known uh, possible uh, ULX pulsar, if we were to go back in time and think it was a ULX pulsar, and all these detections are unpulsed detections. So there is a long, lot of strong evidence this propeller line is real. Is it really true that all the pulsars have the same value of the magnetic field spring? It's extremely unlikely, in most people's opinion. But we will never actually know unless we can do this study for the individual systems, and that's where uh, strobe X will come in. I uh, honestly don't know where I am with time. About, uh, four minutes of the whole period. Okay, great. Okay, so where does Strobex come in? So this, is the, this is the slide we all want to get to. So I did some uh, very simple simulations. I didn't get as far as doing response matrices and spectrum. One, well, re one reason was that I don't really needed to do the spectral uh, thing, and the other thing I didn't find. So I used the PIM simulations, and the caveats are, are on that. So I assume power law index, typical vector mix is an extinction, and I simply assume that the XRCA is 20 nicers, and that the lab is, uh, is 12 RXD PCAs. And then I thought, well, in the galaxy, if we took HMXBs, uh, B pulsars, across the range of which they're known to be interesting, say 10 to the 32, up to maybe 10 to the 39, and I propagated through here, and I asked, how many strobe X counts will I get in the uh, two instruments per second? The black line shows what we would get at five kiloparsecs. This is approximately, and somebody can probably correct me, approximately the range of something like XO2030 from something towards the galaxy center before the spiral arms that's not all the way there. And so this is the beautiful thing about strobe X, that we see that we're getting at 10 to the 36 hertz per second, which is a sort of typical type one outburst, more than 100 counts per second. If we go up into the upper limits, upper ranges of where these things have their outburst, we're getting up into the range of a million counts per second which enables you to hear all of the kinds of things that we're going to do with a single pulse, pulse phase spectroscopy, which obviously has never been done before. It's the thing that everybody who studies things like cyclotron life would love to do. So in the lab, the sensitivity is somewhat lower, but if we look at external galaxies, you know, maybe the lab's larger uh, field of regard could be an advantage because we have more, more, more systems in its field of regard. So if we look out to the SMC, we can see that um, it's possible to get single pulses for SMC pulsars also when they're in the upper range. So, LM, so SMC X3, which recently was in outburst at uh, 10 to the 39 hertz per second, there was a nice paper um, on it uh, using SWIFT data, which, uh, which you can look up, and um, we would be in that regime, but with enough uh, regard to look at the actual individual pulses. So it looks like a pulsar hunting the local group, which is a really exciting part. So if our pulsation detectability is some figure of, say, 200 counts, and I'll tell you why I used 200 counts, I went to the um, archive of all of the, RX, of all of the Chandra RXD and XMM data that Jun uh, Yang and my other grad students and collaborators have um, crunched through and taken made pulse detections in. We made the histogram of uh, how many counts does it take to get 99% significance detection of each pulsar, then we accumulate the histogram and then bend them logarithmically so that we can ask how many counts or what count rate do we need in order to have a 99% chance of detecting a pulsar in an average observation. So this is a kind of a dirty technique because these observations are of many, many different lengths. But the answer that comes out is that around 0.06 counts per second, the ACES or PN, and our XTE could do it in about 0.02 counts per second, and on top of that, we need about 200 counts. So with those kind of things folded into the sensitivity calculation, which hides a multitude of sins, like things like background, that I haven't explicitly done any calculations. We 
you find it in the SMC, you can blind search for pulsars at uh, 10 to the 33 hertz per second, and at uh, 4 megaparsecs, we could do it down to 10 to the 37 hertz per second. This is actually quite in line. I'm happy to see uh, Matt Middleton's numbers were, were similar to those when you talking about the central for searching for such uh, variations in, uh, in new Alexis. So there's one last thing I was going to get in if I have a couple of more minutes, which is um, these large populations enable us to do something which is uh, very fundamental, which is look at things like the mass radius relation or the offset of the magnetic dipole axis or other things to do with the magnetosphere. Very difficult to do for individual systems. We have a lot of systems, you can do them. So this again is work of, uh, of Yang and of Rachel Capallo, two grad students who for recent years. And so they took this um, fitting idea of uh, Balaborodov, which um, posits that there are two isotropic um, antipodal hotspots on the neutron star, and you propagate their rays through general relativity, and as this neutron star spins around, you can model the uh, pulse profile, and from this you can fit things like the, the compactness of the neutron star and the offset of the dipole axis. Now, these systems are not idealized systems because they're pretty pulsing. So the idea of this is to fit hundreds and hundreds of X-ray pulse profiles and see if any of them fit the nice smooth model. And the ones that do, I think it's legitimate to then take the fit parameters out of these and do something with them. And so the something that, uh, that Rigel has done is after fitting all of the um, pulse profiles for SXP 348, the 348-second pulsar in the SMC, which most of the time had a pretty good chi-square, he accumulates the distribution of the, um, the fixed value of the offset angle between the, uh, the magnetic axis and the spin axis. So this is a population distribution as well. It's for a single source, but it's showing that this is something that shouldn't change from observations to the next, and maybe it's a real measurement of the, uh, the bipolar offset. So other things that we can do is look for pulse profiles that do not fit simple profiles and require other components, fan beams and pencil beams, which are what are in these two components. And then if we start running realistic pulse profiles, all kinds of other features, like in particular um, drop-offs, very, very abrupt drop-offs are seen in many X-ray pulse profiles, and these have been commented by a number of uh, researchers. And there are some really interesting possible alternative concepts about what causes those rapid drop-offs. So in our model, the fan beam, as it goes around the back of the neutron star, crosses a terminator that's governed by the compactness parameter of the neutron star and causes the flux to drop out. But um, we were talking to uh, our colleagues recently, and uh, Sebastian Faulkner has a pretty different model where the um, accretion column is extended above the surface of the neutron star, and when it passes into the terminator region, instead of going black, it becomes an Einstein ring, it becomes incredibly bright. And so in the um, What's the word? In the, uh, in the summary of what we know about X-ray pulse profile modeling and what people are doing about it, there is a lot of specific hypotheses that we're ready to make, but we don't have the data that is good enough to actually make those tests. And Strobex is going to give it to us. And if we were just to look at um, what the best properties of Strobex, I would say, for this are, that would be the summary slide. That um, this combination of the broad energy range, the huge effective area, and the time resolution, I think for HMXP is far more important than, than any spectral resolution that probably even applies to people who want to do um, cyclotron wave studies because the yeah, energy resolution that's needed is probably not, not that so not that constrained. So uh, thank you very much. Leave it there.